Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us at QI Power Hour. This is Tracy Sharon from the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. For those of you that might be joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, QI Power Hour is a free monthly webinar learning series hosted by the Health Quality Council. We bring together improvers from a variety of sectors with an interest in improving health and people who are interested in learning about quality improvement related topics. I am joining you from HQC's offices in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. At the Health Quality Council, we serve the entire province of Saskatchewan, which also includes traditional lands that are parts of Treaties 2, 4, 5, 8, and 10. As we gather today to talk about learning health systems and as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation approaches, I encourage us all to learn about the impacts of colonialism and the actions that you can take toward reconciliation. If you want to see what HQC uh, is doing, we have our action plan for this year posted on our website and you can hold, hold us accountable to those actions by checking that out in addition to uh, the progress that we're reporting through our Caring for Culture blog. All of our sessions are recorded and available on our website uh, for viewing at your convenience. So please feel free to go to our website and check out our past QI Power Hour sessions and this session as well will be posted there shortly after. While you're there, uh, we also invite you to sign up for our distribution list to ensure that you receive regular invitations to all of our upcoming QI Power Hour, Hour sessions straight to your email inbox. And you can sign up on our website while you're there. We're very excited to see the continued growth of QI Power Hour throughout our home province of Saskatchewan, across Canada, and around the world. So, we are very much looking forward to your engagement and participation in the webinar today. I see many of you have found the chat function already. That's great. If you haven't, please look for the speech bubble. Uh, it usually appears in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. You can click on that uh, and enter your comments, your questions, your reactions, and your thoughts into the chat. I will be monitoring that throughout the session. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end. So I will be looking to that uh, to post some questions. So please feel free to put them all in there. Um, and you can continue letting us know where you're joining us from today. Please just ensure that you chat to everyone uh, so that we can all see your comments. And now, without further ado, I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Gary Groot to our session to talk about what we know about learning health systems in Canada. Dr. Groot is a professor in the College of Medicine with a joint appointment in community health and epidemiology and surgery. He's also the medical director of clinical quality improvement at the Saskatchewan Health Authority. He is the co-lead of the Saskatchewan Health Authority Learning Health Systems Community of Practice, a member of the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research National, National Learning Health System Community of Practice, and a recipient of the Saskatchewan Centre for Patient-Oriented Research Inaugural Learning Health Systems Research Grant. He was also a valued faculty member with the Health Quality Council's Clinical Quality Improvement Program from its inception. So welcome to Dr. Groot, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. It's um, I kind of feel a, like a bit of an imposter almost because I don't think we've got this figured out yet. So this is going to be for sure a conversation uh, rather than um, than me telling you uh, that I have all the answers for about what a learning health system is. I do have some insights for sure, um, and you know, it, and they continue to grow almost by the day. I'm, I just came back uh, from a, a conference that I was at and uh, one of the people that I was co-presenting with is um, uh, the scientific director of the BC SPORE unit, the, the uh, BC Center for Patient-Oriented Research. And they're struggling very much with the same sort of issues that, that we're struggling with. So you're going to hear from me the sort of where I see this framed within the quality spectrum. Uh, and, and I think it's got lots of potential. I think it's very exciting, um, but it's, it's going to take a little bit of time yet before it's implemented. Um, I, uh, I just want to add a, a little tiny bit to um, the kind introduction and to the land acknowledgement. When, when I do um, a land acknowledgement, myself, I usually take a little bit of time prior to 
to the presentation prior to to presenting and and doing a land acknowledgement to think about what does that mean for me today and it's not always the same thing um i just want to for me uh, as i prepared for this talk um actually I, I i put the final thinking touches on last night when i was flying back from montreal um i can't help but think about uh, all that i've learned from um, indigenous communities and indigenous scholars uh, over the last number of years around how to do um, this kind of work well how to do research with indigenous communities how to do research more broadly i would say that that what they what they uh, claim for themselves is actually something that we should all claim and, and so i just want to talk about the five r's that are that that come up when you doing indigenous community engaged research uh, and trying to apply that to some of this work now the first of those is relationship this takes this kind of work that we're going to talk about takes relationship building uh, respect, respect for the various roles and 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 skills and um, gifts that the various players bring to the table. Reciprocity. Um, we're asking, as you'll see, we're asking people to invest their time and energy um, from various perspectives. And I think there's a, a, a necessity that we give back um, when we do that. That it has to be relevant. So relevance is is the next R, and of course responsibility that we do the work that we do responsibly. So that, that was my reflections uh, in terms of the truth and reconciliation and its significance for this uh, presentation. Uh, these are my learning objectives. Um, uh, hopefully, by the time we're done, you'll understand what is meant by a learning health system, and to understand the difference between learning health systems. Uh, should be plural and clinical quality improvement. I have had a foot in both of those worlds. There's a lot of parallel, but they're not the same. And then to, I'll, I'll try and weave in a little bit of the Canadian landscape around learning health systems as I've learned from colleagues across the country. Just to, to frame this chat with you, um, I, I just want to look at where we've come as a province in, with quality improvement and clinical quality improvement in particular. Um, it, it, it might seem like we've been at this forever and not getting anywhere, but the reality is Health Quality Council was formed in 2002. Um, the lean journey, uh, some people say we're not supposed to talk about lean anymore, but I still think that there was a lot of important learnings that happened uh, with that journey. That started around 2008. Uh, many of you will have had some inter interaction and interface with with lean and I'm going to allude to that a little bit in a moment or talk about it a bit. Uh, the patient first review happened in 2009. Um, the um, HQC and the um, Saskatchewan Medical Association teamed together to send a number of clinicians to Intermountain Health and that started around 2011. I was one of the people that were fortunate enough to be able to um, go and learn from Brent James. And then that that sort of led or moved into uh, appropriateness of care um, as, a, as an initiative that was led by the ministry. And I co-led that uh, with, um, uh, and it was sort of under, within HQC. Um, and that went on for a number of years until it was transferred in 2017 to um, the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, the CQIP program uh, was run through uh, HQC uh, for a number of years. And as um, Tracy mentioned, I was uh, one of the, the faculty that delivered that program over, I think, five cohorts, five we did. Um, and then, um, and then there's there's all the data work that's being done by the Saskatchewan Center for Patient Oriented Research and and HQC Ministry of Health um, that that all of that work around patient oriented research that's been ongoing now for a while, and then now we're at this the, the cusp of of introducing learning health systems, and I would argue that we never quite. Um, um, 
finished our journey with clinical quality improvement and now we're on to the next the next piece which is as i move along is is one of the one of the challenges if you will around these things is it's kind of like we're we're hardly mastered one one thing and we're already moving on to something else but fortunately in my mind at least there there's enough overlap that it's um that we can take the learnings from the the clinical quality improvement work which is still relevant and apply it to the emerging thinking around learning health systems i think this this adaptation from um the Canadian Medical Association, I think, helps me stay focused because this is, regardless of what what tools you, you want to take out of your toolbox, what we're really trying to do is to provide the right care by provided by the right providers to the right patient in the right place at the right time, resulting in optimal care. And it sounds so simple, and yet, the, as you all know, healthcare systems are so complex that this is really seems challenging to to do well and um, and learning health systems is just one one way to try and help us accomplish this but i don't think even as we try and and um, embrace learning health systems and and incorporate them into the way we do business i think we need to be careful to remember that the goal is not learning health system the goal is providing good quality care um and not not lose sight of that. These are the dimensions of quality that are mentioned by um, the um, Institute of Medicine, um, and these are all laudable. They're all what we're trying to accomplish. But as you know, um, there's lots of tensions in terms of. Um, moving the dial on these various these various dimensions of quality simultaneously so that we're not um, sometimes providing efficient care gets lost temporarily in the term in in our effort to be more timely or we lose lose a little sight of the equitability of of the care that's provided in the effort to be efficient and and bring down wait times or whatever. So the, this sounds really nice, but um, not always not always easy to accomplish again. Uh, but these are the dimensions of quality that we should be focused on as we as we try and deliver the best care to our patients. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ramble here a little bit because I'm gonna go back to the 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 lean journey that. I've been told sometimes that I'm not supposed to talk about it anymore. Um, but I think if I go back to the, the surgical initiative um, of about 10, 15 years ago, um, and uh, some of the times that I sat and, and talked with um, Dr. Peter Barrett, who was leading that. And I remember Peter was pretty adamant that yes we need to we need to be efficient we need to learn that's the 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 lean mantra really is to get rid of waste and to 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 build a car efficiently um that's the the goal of of that that mindset is how do we go about building a car most efficiently getting rid of waste uh, listening to people at the front line who are actually doing the work who know how to make those processes more more efficient and in doing that i think we can we can um, improve the the efficiency of the care we provided i met with um one of my surgical divisions today because i'm trying to see how we can uh, address the the challenge that's been going on with meeting uh, targets for cancer wait times and getting their insights so i'm i'm I didn't really think about it till just now, but I guess I'm doing the gamble walk. I'm going and talking to to the people that are doing the work and saying, "Tell me how we can improve this. What what do you need from the system in order to make a difference?" And they one of the things they said is the operating room doesn't run very efficiently, 
Um, I can tell you it's been 30 years now I've been in, in Saskatoon operating. And we still almost never start our, our theater on, on time. So there's lots of efficiencies that can still be addressed within our system. But the other thing that Dr. Barrett was very, very adamant about was that we that the care we provide be appropriate. And that's what led to the appropriateness of care initiative within the ministry and now within the SHA. And that is more about about are we doing are we doing the right are we building the right car in the first place? Or maybe we don't need a car, we need a bicycle. So when it comes to to the care we provide to our patients, are we when we order a CT scan, is that CT scan really needed? Um, or is it is it something that that could be done with something else? Um, I know when we did some work around low back pain, uh, we initially started by by focusing on unnecessary MRIs. There was a lot of unnecessary MRIs being ordered uh, for low back pain, and we got all of the experts together that say these are the criteria for why you need to when you need to do a, an MRI. I learned a lot out of that because I'm not a spine surgeon, and I learned that for the most part, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, MRIs are uh, should be ordered if as a planning tool for surgery. So the, the, the decision to have surgery or not surgery is based on uh, clinical presentation. And before a surgeon proceeds with surgery, they need an MRI to give them the, the roadmap to how to go forward. It's not so much for diagnostic purposes, um, but many clinicians, including myself, didn't really fully understand that. So we created an algorithm to to help you know people get an MRI when they needed it and not have one when they didn't. And then I, I remember sitting in in a room with these experts and saying, "Well, what do you think happens to all these people that were getting unnecessary MRIs?" And so he said, oh, "Well, they're probably all getting CTs now." And the guys and the, the the experts said that that can't be. And uh, sure enough, we looked into it, and the number of CT, unnecessary CT scans of the low back were had gone like exponentially high. And so, uh, when we you look at that, it's because these these people are out there; they're having pain, and their pain isn't being addressed. So it's like, oh, we, we'll do something, right? As opposed to what they really needed. And so we still haven't solved that problem, I don't think. Um, at least there's, I understand it now, finally. But doing the appropriate set of tests or investigations or simple is something that we still um, we still need a, a lot of work to do. This is um, just a just a for a talking point. So I have something to talk about or to remind me to talk about. Uh, and that is, this is the, the model for improvement um, that has been, we've all embraced and used regularly, the plan, the PDSS, PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act. Uh, and this is, you're going to see something with learning health systems that looks very, very similar to this. And I think it's why there's sometimes a confusion between clinical quality improvement or quality improvement in general and learning health systems. Um, so I'm just wanted to highlight that this is sort of at the core of, of improvement uh, and the model for improvement that we do. Th we do these fairly rapid um, trials of something, see if it worked, if it doesn't work, try something else, that sort of a thing. Uh, and this is something that I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with. And then if you wanna get you know complicated, you, you do it on steroids and you, tackle multiple PDSA cycles along multiple interventions to address uh, a really big, more wicked problem. But this is still quality improvement. Um, there's nothing new that's happening uh, here. You might you might uh, do try one intervention that your initial um, uh, map led you to, but at the same time, rather than do them sequentially, you're going to try several things at the same time so that you can address uh, a, a more uh, significant problem um, quicker. So you see this happening right now with the, the surgical initiative. There's a um, orthopedic model line work that's happening within the SHA, and they're doing multiple PDSA cycles. There's a team one and a team two, and we're just standing up a, an appropriateness of care team as well. So there, there's going to be like a few of these um, these pathways running in parallel uh, to try and address the the backlog in the surgery.
And, and in comes this new idea of learning health systems. So this was um, actually, this is a slide that comes out of the Canadian Institute for Health Research, CIHR. Um, and it shows you where the, where and when the, the shift to learning health systems occurred uh, in, in the, um, within CIHR and in their effort to train a new generation of researchers that are more partnered with health systems. So for the, those of you that are, uh, have an interface with research, the, the classical research work is done in siloed uh, by academic institutions. Uh, and they would do this um, research that can take, that takes forever to accomplish anything. Uh, I still remember when I was doing um, a, a piece of work with um, the appropriateness of care work, uh, Mark Wyatt, who was the deputy minister or assistant De deputy minister at the time, um, asked us to look at something to do with breast cancer, which is an area that I'm um, quite interested in. And I said, well, you know, I got all the surgeons together and they said, um, you know, we don't know the answer to this, which is why, why do we in Saskatchewan have the second highest mastectomy rate in the country? And he said, well, let's, we need to find out the answer because Kai High is going to publish this report and uh, it's, it doesn't look good for Saskatchewan. So I said, well, I think this is a research project. And he said, no, I don't even want to hear research. And I just, you know, no, figure it out. And so we did a parallel process and I had a, uh, one of my residents did a PhD with me. And then we did some work on the side of trying to fix the problem without the research. And they took, we actually found the solution faster than the system was able to, because the system's just doing, right? So the, the whole idea of learning health systems in, in this new generation of researchers is that, that researchers will partner and be embedded within the research and, and help the system as they try and implement things more quickly to try and, and address that, that normal, you know, long cycle from research to implementation of those findings but rather that we would be working very much alongside. So this, this whole concept started with CIHR back in um, around 2015, I think, and has just progressively increased. So now there, there are um, um, opportunities for people to trainees to be embedded within our health system and, and um, try and work and and move forward, and it, it's very interesting because the, um, the they have they have meetings where they talk about the challenges of that, and it's interesting because the challenges are the same across the board. But I think we can work through those challenges. They're they're just like how do you how do you truly integrate research into a health system? How does re how do researchers find new methods that are more that are more quick, at, but at the same time robust? And then how do those things get implemented into, into the system? For me, the, one of the beauties of this kind of work is, is that you're not doing research for the sake of research, but rather it's research that's wanted and desired by the system and almost certainly will be implemented to some degree or other. And I don't know why anybody would put, go to all the trouble of doing research <clears throat> if they didn't have a likelihood of being implemented. That's just my personal bias. So when you look at a learning learning health systems, again, there should be there's there isn't one learning health system, but rather probably multiple learning health systems, even within a, a system like SHA. But it's a system of science, informatics, incentives, cultures that align to do that continuous improvement in and in innovation, uh, and embedding best practice into the delivery of process, and most importantly, that 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 you're learning from your own system and your own um, your own data that gets generated by what's happening in your system, um, and that's it. That's it. That's that's it. It's simple, but not so simple. This is a a diagram that comes out of um, uh, an article by ben by Manier in 2019, uh, sort of trying to to look at learning health systems from a Canadian perspective because a lot of the initial work. Uh, comes out of the US and it doesn't always transfer or translate well into Canada. So Manir, uh, who's from um, Quebec, uh, did uh, publish this paper and is heavily used in, in across Canada as a, as a sort of a framework, if you will. 
I think the important thing is at the bottom, you'll see these learning health system pillars. You need to have these things in place before a hurt learning health system um, will fire or activate uh, effectively. And I think a lot of those, the, you know, the HQC and the Ministry of Health, um, our healthcare system, have been spending the last 20 years building this, these core values and building the, the, the pillars. I would argue that we still have in, in Saskatchewan, we still have a, a challenge, particularly around the technological or data side of things. Um, we, um, we're, we've done a fairly good job with building the infrastructure for many of these other uh, parts of the system, but the, um, the, the data pillar is still lagging a little bit and not just uh, act, not just the having the data, but linking data and having um, researchers and, and the system be able to access that data. Uh, it's, we're getting there, but it's, that's the challenge that we have. And if you look at the middle box, the, these, this is sort of the, the, the core of a learning health system. And I'm going to look at into that uh, a little bit um, more detailed with you in just a moment. So you don't have to, um, digest all of this in 1 minute. And then the idea is that this brings a, the value proposition is that it improves patient experience, uh, at, and simultaneously improves provider experience, uh, uh, addresses healthcare costs to some extent and improves population health. So this is, this is the framework of uh, a learning health system. And I'm not quite sure what happened with this slide, but it, um, it is, you'll be able to make sense of it. It's a a little bit distorted from the from the slide. I'm going to actually go back one because I think it'll it shows better on the on this one here. Uh, that's what that slide is supposed to look like. Um, so again, here the the idea is that uh, that we form a community of interest, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and then we clarify the problem, we reflect critically on it, and we take. I usually would start, we take knowledge to, to practice to start with, and this is a cycle, right? So you'll, you'll find out what's going on out there. What do we know about a particular um, problem and how to manage it? We, we implement that into practice to the best of our ability. Uh, and, then we, and then we collect data on our own experience to see, does it work the way it's supposed to work? So we all, uh, maybe we don't all know, but it is well known at this point that often, Things like randomized control trials, uh, which are very highly uh, regulated, don't function th exactly like that in the real world. So this is our opportunity to get real world data in our own environment to see does does that particular pr practice work the way we expect it to. We take that data, we we create knowledge, our own knowledge from that about our about how we're doing things. And then we feed it back into practice again, and it goes around and around. And as we learn more, we, we, I think one of the key elements of this is it's not static. It's constantly um, moving and uh, changing, and it needs to stay, stay um, refreshed with new knowledge as we go forward. Here's our little mutated slide. Um, this is the one that I, this is, so that that framework by Monero is is what's shown frequently. Um, I I have a particular bias for this this one um, this other framework, which is Charles Friedman is the sort of the the grandfather of in a way of the concept of learning health systems. Um, he is from the states, uh, and when he would talk about learning health system, he would say that the, at the center of a learning health system is this formation of a learning community. Now, learning community is a built is derived from um, patient patient partners, um, clinicians, decision makers within the system, and researchers. And and I. I don't think there's often enough emphasis put on on the formation of this learning community. Um, I want to just 
check my time to make sure I'm not rambling on too long. I think I'm okay still. Um, if I if I look at one of the things that I'm working with right now, which is a little bit the Learning Health System Award that I have, but also work that I'm doing um, with the SHA, which is the the creation of um, a, a pathway for post COVID condition or long COVID. It's complex, and we we have a learning community um, formed. Um, I, I sit on the on the development team. Um, there's decision makers within the SHA that are on that team as well. Uh, we have some patient partners that we work with, and um, and and then I'm there also. I sort of wear two hats. I'm there as a researcher. And and so when we develop as we move forward and we try and implement this this um, uh, pathway, we realize that that there's lots of things that we that we didn't know when we first got started, right? And and how do we know what what are the things we need to focus on? So we started. I'm just going to give you one crude example. We started by saying, um, well, most of, we did some work with modeling. Most of the post-COVID condition patients um, don't require acute care, thank God, uh, because there's a lot of them. About 15% of the population uh, who have uh, who contract COVID will ultimately have some some degree of long COVID, and about half of those will go on for over a year. And many of them are disabled, so they can't work or can only minimally work. So it's a pretty big issue. Uh, that was the conference I was at in Montreal. We were talking about that. Uh, what we started with here is, is to say, well, since most of these people are not super sick and we risk overwhelming the healthcare system, we'll develop a, a suite of tools for self-management. Uh, this has been done in other provinces, so it's not like we were inventing the wheel. And we created that. We went and we got some research support um, and, and sort of did an environmental scan. We brought in um, clinicians who were, had expertise in their sp specific areas to review those. And, and these are now on the website since March or so. Now, that's where we often stop, right? So we didn't learn from that. Well, what we need to do now, from my perspective, is we have a, a, a patient advisory council of people with lived experience with long COVID, and I'm meeting with them next week. And we're going to say one of the things that we'll do, there'll be multiple things we do here, but one of them would be to say, okay, we, we put up these, these tools, are they useful or, or are they a waste of time? Are you able, do they, do they help you the way we envisioned they would help you? And that's a little research project that needs to happen to see that our, is the system functioning the way we hope it will. So uh, another thing might be once we have access to um, data around their use uh, of the healthcare system, are they getting the support that they need? Like, there's a number of different things we can see like that, uh, that we could learn from. And then as we learn from uh, these people, as they go through the system and the pathway that's been designed, the, the knowledge that we would get from their interactions with the healthcare system will allow us to improve the pathway that's been developed, and and then we would can re-examine their data and make further tweaks as we go forward. So I, I that's the concept. Um, again, pretty simple on on the surface, but when you're in the middle of trying to do something like this, this is often what it feels like. At least to me, it feels like just this this cacophony of of things that just don't go the way they're supposed to and we can't get the data and you know this and that and and the other thing and so this is what i often feel like when i'm um working in the middle of of one of these things and it's with this long covid pathway or even pathways more broadly there are days when this is what it feels like to me um that doesn't mean that um that it has to stay that way and that's I, I'm I'm an eternal optimist, and I think that that we just need to work through some of these things. It helps me when I go to things like this conference and talking with my BC colleagues and my colleagues in in Ontario and and uh, Quebec and all, all across the country. And this they're experiencing the same challenges that we are. So you know, it's just like okay, this is something we have to we have to work through. It's not 
it's not the, the terrible cacophony that I showed you. So these are some of the challenges that I see um, with uh, the implementation of uh, learning health system. The first one is some, some integration with Saskatchewan Health Authority organizational culture, because at least in my mind, most of these um, uh, most of these should be embedded within the the organization, but we don't have. We're still nascent. I mean, I know we became a single health authority a few years back, but then we had a, this thing called a pandemic that sort of got in the way, and so I don't think we've we've yet reached the point where we um, have an integrated um, pathway, if you will, for how to, how we're how the SHA is going to work uh, and how the SHA will um, provide this kind of learning health system. I think it's still a, a work in progress um, within the portfolio that I work in, QSI, uh, with which provides a lot of these support services. The the support services are still a bit bit siloed. We haven't figured out, and I, I'm using the I'm saying we because I'm a part of that. We haven't figured out how we can provide um, services to a group that would come forward, like the Long COVID Pathway. Um, with the with the various patient partners and and um, decision makers, clinicians, researchers, and and provide the support they need in a in a in a cohesive and seamless fashion. So that's something that is um, we're getting there, but we're not there quite yet. We haven't we haven't really figured out how to do embedded research, and that's not just Saskatchewan. That's across um, across the country. Uh, there's lots of issues like uh, the, the conference who, that I just was at. Uh, it was heartening for me to hear um, that this isn't unique to us. Um, when I when we had the um, uh, Canada Scientific Advisor uh, at the meeting, we had uh, Canadian Institute for Health Research represented at the meeting, and people said you know, across the board, there's there's barriers, institutional barriers to doing this kind of work. Um, there's institutional barriers around promotion and tenure at the university that has nothing to do with the SHA. But you know, if somebody's doing embedded research, do they get um, do they get recognition uh, from from their institution that they're working in? If they're not the NPI on a grant, nominated principal applicant, which is the or investigator, which is which is right now what what gets most credit if you're looking for promotion and tenure. I have the luxury of not having to worry about that because I'm a full professor, but any anybody who's an assistant professor or social professor, their job and their job security is tied to those kinds of deliverables. So that's important. But also, you know, I, I've I've heard and it's not unique to Saskatchewan where, you know, higher level uh, decision makers, they, they don't want to hear about research. They don't want they say, don't talk about research. I don't I'm not interested. And I think we need to to change that culture where research is is not a dirty word, and research doesn't have to slow the process down. Uh, I think it, it it has to be embedded, and we have to learn how to how to incorporate that kind of research, and how to incorporate how and researchers have to learn how to work within health systems as well. So there's a there's a fair bit of work and learning to be done around how to do this well. Uh, data access continues to be, as I alluded to earlier, a huge problem in Saskatchewan. Um, even within within the SHA, and like uh, we met just recently around this, the long COVID or the long COVID pathway, and we're trying to make sure that that um, patients can be identified. That we have a single point of entry for for people who have long COVID. This is just being set up. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll be through eight one one, and then a um, assessment process. First, a triage process, and then a, a virtual assessment process. We hope to be able to, to to say yes, you likely have long COVID. Long COVID, unfortunately, doesn't have a blood test associated with it, so it's a clinical diagnosis. But still, we can identify who we who is felt to have long COVID, and then from there, you know, my simple brain says, well, we should then be able to track their. Their utilization, who they go to see, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
And when we met with digital health, they said, well, yeah, actually, there, we don't we don't have that kind of one process yet for the for the SHA. There's multiple processes for depending on where you live as to how that is stored and, and accessed, et cetera. So it's not just a question of of getting privacy to allow us to have access to the data, but it's also the the technological infrastructure is not the same. It's not unified across the province. So being able to learn from our own experiences, our patient experiences, is um, not impossible. I mean, they, they're working with us, but difficult. And if you don't set it up in advance, like we're trying to do with the, the long COVID pathway and the future pathways going forward, it becomes very, very challenging because then you're trying to retrofit stuff uh, after the fact. And then I think one of the other ones that uh, that that is a challenge, and it's a challenge not just for uh, Saskatchewan; it's a challenge for most provinces. Is is the learning health system part of the the reciprocity and the giving back? Is that we're going to ask patients and um, decision makers and clinicians to invest time and energy in solving some of these wicked problems. Uh, but we're reluctant to hand over the decision making um, or, or to work with them in a way that that the decision makers um, in a timely fashion say that's a nice idea, but we we're not going to be able to implement that. So this this um, how do we give some degree of power to the the teams that we form around these sort of um, learning health systems? So that they feel empowered and rewarded for the work that they're doing, um, at the same time without the system feeling like they're they're abdicating their decision making responsibility is a is a is a huge um, challenge that needs to be worked through. And then finally, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're aligned when we do these with system priorities. So um, I'm working with. Um, Clinical excellence around pathways, and the 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 push for pathway development, as which is a part of learning health systems, um, has gone from yeah we we maybe have one or two three something like that to can we do ten next year, and we don't have that capacity, so we have to be able to say okay what are the system priorities, and then say okay we're going to work on these ones this year these are the system priorities for this year, and these other ones might inform. The, the other interested parties might form um, the priorities for subsequent years. So figuring out how to how to do that and uh, and ca and and capture the enthusiasm that's out there because trust me there is a massive enthusiasm for this kind of work. Um, and if we're not careful, we can we can um, make people feel frustrated and and lose sight of. Of what 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 the potential is here. So these all of this kind of work takes a lot of uh, resource. So it has to be aligned with the system, and we need to support people to to take their their enthusiasm, and hold on to it until um, the system is ready to work with them. And I think I will turn it over to questions. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Groot. Um, I think you gave us a lot to think about. Um, and we do have lots of time for some questions and some discussion here. So I would really encourage folks to put your uh, questions, comments, thoughts in the chat. While you're doing that, maybe I'll start us off. Um, so I think you talked a lot about, I'm going to call it a, a tension that exists between, you know, research and practice. So, um, you know, I think, I think that tension might always exist. Uh, there's, there's different methods, different priorities, different speeds at which systems work. But you talked about, you know, we're starting to see some uh, evolution of methods for research that are um, a little quicker, that might be a little more responsive to the needs of practice. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you're seeing out there for the, some of those new methods that are coming up. I, I, I think to begin with, um, I'm, I'm going to go with what we're not looking at. Um, so randomized control trials are really important for sure. Um, but that's the methodology that um, applies for certain things and then needs, still needs to be tested in the real world. One of the methods that, that I do a lot um, is, is called realist research, which is a, a, 
it's more a philosophy than anything else. It's a it, it's a it's a way of thinking about research that looks to understand um, complex issues in terms of how does something work, but not just how does it work, but for whom, and in what context. So um, it, you can use all kinds of different traditional research methods in doing that, but it it'll it's an acknowledgement that that this a system will work in a certain way sometimes, but not other times. So it, it, I, when I'm doing that kind of work, so with the, um, with the long COVID pathway, I, I'm just starting to bring a team together to do this sort of thing, uh, where we'll look at different, why does it work in, why does this pathway as we're developing, it seem to work in Regina, but not Saskatoon. Um, and that's about just asking questions. There's a lot of qualitative work in that. There's some quantitative as well in terms of saying, yes, it do, it's working here and it's not working there. But what I want to know with the system is why. Um, what and, and then from there, you, you try and modify and change things as you go. So um, I'm sort of at the, I think, the forefront of trying to rethink how to do that across Canada. I'm really excited uh, with some of the, the funding I've gotten because I think that's what the system really needs is researchers who are a little bit more nimble and uh, and able to make an observation. This is this is working in this situation. Why not? Why here and not there? And the other thing is I, I get quite down and dirty, if you will. I go and talk to the people and I say, what do you think is going on? And sometimes it's, the, it's not at all what traditional research sort of tries to control for. It's the things that are going on in people's minds, uh, which realists would call mechanisms. So the things like, well, you know, you're asking me to do this, but I know better. I, I've been doing this for 30 years. Who are you to tell me what to do? And it's really that you're, the, the pushback, the reason it's not working in that in that setting is might be because you, you're offending them, you know? And so you need to, how you implement it might need to be different. So there's lots of different little implementation science tricks that that go into it, but I think a lot of it is just you need to build trust. That's the, again the the going back to the um, uh, the um, indigenous work, you know, building relationships in healthcare system work is critical. I think so. Some, if if somebody doesn't trust me when I go and ask them, if my colleagues don't trust me, they're not going to tell me that that they're they're acting the way they do because they're it's going to impact their either their autonomy or the sense of autonomy or their income. Nobody's going to say, I'm I'm not going to do that because I'm going to lose money. They might, but most likely they won't. They'll give you another reason, right? So unless they trust you, you're not going to get the real answers. And that's true with indigenous work too. So I think we've we can learn a lot from our indigenous colleagues in terms of how to do this. Sorry, I was rambly. Oh, that was a great answer. Thanks. I think the other thing that occurred to me as you were talking is that can help us inform, you know, how we achieve these results at scale. So even if you're seeing things that are working in different places, asking that question of why helps set us up to better, you know, spread what we're learning to other places because we understand more about why it works in what contexts and for whom. So Yeah, if I if I could just build on that a little bit. Absolutely. Canada is uh, a very well known um, country of pilot projects and scaling doesn't work well if you're not thinking about the scaling when you're doing whatever pilots, if you will. Um, pilot is still an important part, but it should be done within the framework of I'm planning to scale this up. Um, so like the, the, the work we're going to be doing that we got funded to do for my mind is not so much about um, a bunch of pilots, but trying to learn from the pilots so that we can scale up in the future. Great. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions flooding in, so I'm going to try to get to all of these now. Um, so one question asks uh, that we often tend to focus on hospital resource use. How do you incorporate this? So the idea I'm assuming they're asking about, you know, learning health systems into primary care. Um, actually, I, I don't think the jump is very hard. So I would I would argue some some things are entirely primary care for sure, um, and that you could do the similar kind of um, quality improvement work within a, a clinic or that sort of thing. I know HQC's got their their newest version of um, CQIP is a 
condensed version to support primary care in their clinics. And, and that's a that's not that's not brand new. I you know other jurisdictions are doing similar work as that. But I, I think a lot of the, our work is actually what I would call integrated care. So there's an acute care component to the work. So think about somebody with diabetes. The, sometimes if they get really sick, they come in, you know, in diabetic coma or their their sugars are out of, out of whack or whatever. There's that a, there's a component that of care that happens in the acute care system, but then they transition to back to their own their own home, if you will, to their their network, their primary care unit, whatever. And that's something that's still being developed in Saskatchewan. But I think. When you look at a learning health system, it should it should cross all of that continuum. So when I, we're trying to develop a pathway for long COVID, we're we're seeing that the majority of care will not happen in the acute care system. Some of it will for sure, but the vast majority will happen in primary care, and and the interface between those two, how they go back and forth, how do we support primary care, is is I think part of a learning health system. Um, now, how do you accomplish that? Because we don't control primary care. In my mind, and this is just my simplistic surgeon brain, uh, it, in my mind, if we're doing it well, they're going to want to be at the table because it makes their life easier. But their life, I mean, the patients and the providers. And so if we're doing this this properly and we're providing them with the data and the information that, that they need to care for their patients, they will embrace this um, both pri primary care physicians, um, networks, uh, as well as patients, because they they'll feel like that their care is, is improved, and and it's easier to to provide the care, not harder, and that's uh, I think the way the whole concept. Yeah, I think too. Um, one of the things you said earlier, you talked about you know forming learning communities. That to me seems to be, you know, one way to, to do that as well. And something we continue to learn in our work is that just relatively simple act of bringing people together to share what they're learning, to share what they're trying is hugely powerful in helping to kind of bring those communities together and to, to spread and share those practices. I, I, um, I've got it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I'm going to keep going back because I just came from from meeting my colleagues around long COVID. But one of the things they're do they've done in BC is they created a portal for patient in involvement. So patients can go and 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 on this on the on this website, they they can enter in their symptoms, they can be told whether they're likely to have long COVID or not, where they can can access care in their area, which is a, a we're we're working on doing a similar thing with uh, Nate Osgood. Not and, and and also whether what clinical trials are available if they want to become involved with them as it's an area where we're still learning. So some things like that could be also brings a community, creates a community of of uh, people and researchers and decision makers that have a space together. Right. So we have another question here about who is typically the initiator, coordinator, and funder of these types of projects. And do they have the flexibility to incorporate new stakeholder groups like healthcare professionals who are not employed by the health authority or unions? Um, the answers the people that are that have an interest. So no, and so if I so this is where I haven't yet talked about what's going on across the country. So maybe this is the the space where I can talk about that. Uh, so I do sit on um, uh, patient oriented research spore learning health system sort of community of practice where we talk about what is happening in various provinces. And I can say that that we're not unique in Saskatchewan. This is being tried in different provinces in different ways. And, and they're still very much in, in the pilot phase in every province. Um, so they're funded largely through things like um, a collaboration between uh, a health authority and something like uh, Skipper, which is a, a CIHR funded organization. Um, so right now that tends to be how it how it happens. But it, I can see in the future, like if I look with my future eyes, I could see that this is something that the healthcare system will do uh, and fund. And yes, it should include um, not only the acute care system, but but people that are don't ever practice their their craft within 
the walls of a, of a SHA facility. Um, and it's, it's when you bring those teams together, I think that you'll see who are the right people that need to be there. And, uh, I, you know, there, there's some cost to this for sure, but it's not, I think the, the evidence would point that the benefit, the savings are bigger than the cost. So I think the system would, should be the ones that pays for this. That's my bias. We're not there yet though. No. Um, okay, there's a, a lot of questions here. We have just a couple more minutes. I'm just going to try and get through what's left. <laughs> uh, so, let's see, um, I, I'm seeing some sharing of resources in the chat, which is great. So, Rachel has shared um, a link to some uh, resources about evaluation and rapid research from the United Kingdom. So, thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing those. I'd encourage folks to check those out. Um, this is an interesting one. So, just. The, this person's wondering if you have any examples across Canada that by use, by doing embedded research where this actually led to change by policymakers. So changes in, in the way care was practiced or, uh, you know, policies were implemented and how long it takes in reality to implement those changes. So, I don't have any at my fingertip. I can tell you they do exist um, it, and it's, it still takes time. Um, it takes less time than the traditional research cycle, which is like 10 to 14 years. Uh, so it's probably at least half of that. But yeah, there are examples across the country with provinces that are a little bit further along with their, um, their trials of learning health systems. And I would say there's some pockets in Ontario, for example, some in Quebec for sure, BC, that would be the prime places. Great, thank you. And 1 final 1, um, so, uh, wondering if you could please comment on when we initiate the form formation of a community of interest or community of practice is, is that, you know, generally the 1st step to identify problems or does, does the identification of problems or issues to solve naturally lead to the creation of the communities kind of a chicken or egg question. Uh, yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I, so, I, I think that that the system, because of the because it takes some organization to create this sort of thing, the system needs to say, yeah, this is something we're going to work on. And then, and then the almost for sure the, the actors or the players exist already at that point. And it's a matter of creating uh, the place for them to empower, to work together. Um, so I would say that they're almost simultaneously. Uh, I, I can't imagine there'd be a single um, significant healthcare issue that we'd want to tackle where the those those actors don't already exist and are are just waiting to be invited in. And I think as you alluded to our our health system priorities are a great place to start. I mean there's a lot of questions there that need answering. Let's bring people together to help answer those. Okay. Well, I as much as I'd love to to keep going, uh, we are at the end of our hour. Thanks so much to uh, all of you listening for submitting all your great questions uh, and chat comments. Thank you so much to you, Dr. Groot, for coming and sharing uh, your knowledge on learning health systems. Um, uh, it sounds as though we've got a lot of great pieces to build upon in Saskatchewan. Just need to keep connecting them together and to keep building the infrastructure to support it. So I'll maybe kind of move us into the wrap up. There's lots of lots of gratitude and thanks uh, happening in the chat. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those comments. So I'll, I'll uh, just wrap us up here. Um, so um, you see on the screen a picture of our lovely in-demand uh, iHeart quality improvement socks. Uh, if you'd like to get your hands on a pair of those, uh, we'd love to invite you to become a QI Power Hour speaker, uh, Dr. Groot. Um, you've probably got a few pairs already from your involvement of other in other programs, but uh, watch your mailbox for for some iHeart QI socks. Um, and we'd love to hear if you're out there listening and you have an idea you'd like to share with the community, please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. When you leave the webinar, you will be taken to a post webinar survey. Uh, please don't be alarmed. It is a trusted site. You can follow that link. Uh, we practice what we preach. Uh, we want to hear your ideas about how we can be doing better with QI Power Hour. Uh, so please do take a couple of minutes to share your thoughts. We would very much appreciate that. And uh, want to invite you to attend next month in October um, to hear about advancing the healthcare system using patient reported experience measures and patient reported outcome measures, which I think is just great timing for that topic to follow up on learning health systems, uh, because this is a, a key measure of how we learn. 
um, about val the value we're providing to patients. So really looking forward to hearing that. Uh, with our own uh, HQC staff, Ala Abourab and Hamad Ejelanabu. So I uh, would really encourage you to, to join us in October to check that out. And with that, we've reached the end of our session today. Thank you to Dr. Groot for presenting, to all of you for engaging in such rich conversation. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.